Thomas here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman, as we turn to investigative reporter Barrett Brown, who recently completed a four-year prison sentence related to the hacking of the private intelligence firm Stratfor, which exposed how the firm spied on activists on behalf of corporations. At one point, Brown faced 100 years in prison before pleading guilty to lesser charges, including transmitting threats, accessory to a cyber attack and obstruction of justice. Supporters say Brown was unfairly targeted for investigating the highly secretive world of private intelligence and military contractors. Prior to his arrest, Brown appeared in the documentary We Are Legion and talked about the importance of information obtained by hackers. Some of the most important things that have been uh, have had the most far-reaching influence and have been the most important in terms of what's been discovered, not just by anonymous, by, but by the media in the aftermath, is the result of hacking. That information can't be obtained by the traditional journalistic process, or it can't be obtained or won't be obtained by a congressional committee or a federal oversight committee. Uh, for the most part, that information has to be, you know, obtained by hackers. In 2009, Barrett Brown created Project PM, which was, quote, dedicated to investigating private government contractors working in the secretive fields of cybersecurity, intelligence and surveillance. He was particularly interested in the documents leaked by WikiLeaks and Anonymous. In 2011, the group Anonymous hacked into the computer system of the private security firm H.B. Gary Federal and disclosed thousands of internal emails. Barrett Brown was not accused of being involved in the hack itself, but he did read and analyze the documents, eventually crowdsourcing the effort through the Project PM. One of the first the first things he discovered was a plan to tarnish the reputations of WikiLeaks and the journalist Glenn Greenwald, who would later win a Pulitzer Prize for his reporting on NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden. While serving in prison, Barrett Brown won the 2016 National Magazine Award for columns and commentary for columns he wrote for The Intercept. He was released from prison earlier this year, but was unexpectedly rearrested late last month, one day ahead of a scheduled interview for an upcoming PBS documentary. Barrett Brown was detained for four days and then released without receiving any formal written explanation for the arrest. Despite pressure from authorities not to speak to the media while under house arrest, Barrett Brown has opted not to keep silent. Democracy Now!'s Nermeen Sheikh and I spoke to him earlier this week, along with Glenn Greenwald, who is in our New York studio. I began by asking Barrett Brown why he was imprisoned for four years. The FBI's original search warrants uh, came out after we had, you know, begin, begun documenting the DOJ and FBI's illegal involvement with uh, intelligence contractors against uh, journalists and activists. Uh, the search warrants uh, stated that they were looking for information on H.P. Gary, one of the firms, as you mentioned, that uh, had been involved in these crimes, uh, in-game systems, uh, another, another firm we were looking at, and uh, our echelon2.org wiki on which we compiled this uh, research. Uh, later on, they charged me with entirely different crimes involving the Stratford hack, uh, which had already occurred and, uh, you know, before the original search warrants. It, it, they, they were just looking for something to get me on that wouldn't involve going into some of these more nefarious projects that they were you know, indirectly involved in. So I eventually pled to, uh, after they dropped a number of very bizarre charges involving uh, linking to information after a public outcry, uh, I pled guilty to uh, interference with the search warrant, uh, threatening a federal agent, and accessory after the fact for having called the uh, executive of Stratford and uh, offering to redact you know, sensitive information. Um, so that was the that was what they got me on eventually. Uh, so I did four years, uh, first a low security, then a medium security federal prison. Uh, documented further abuses by the BOP. Um, you know, spent about six months all together in the hole or the, the shoe uh, of that four-year period and, you know, did what I could to try to show people uh, how, how the prisons operate, uh, the extent to which due process violations are very common and, and hard to defend against. Uh, but none of that really came, came to anything, obviously. You can only document so much in a culture like this uh, and expect anything to happen from it. And it's sort of a... a uh, a difficult culture to, to actually really get journalism to work in. And Barrett, uh, could you tell us what reason you were given, if any, for your rearrest? Before I was arrested, the BOP had been claiming that I was not allowed to do interviews without their permission, which I happen to know is false. It's actually documented very clearly in the Bureau of Prisons program statement on media contacts, which I've linked to in a recent e-magazine piece 
that there is no such stipulation. Even inmates in the prisons can talk to journalists by the phone or uh, mail without permission. The only uh, aspect of that that requires permission is if a journalist wants to come into an actual prison on a certain day and interview an inmate at that prison. The BOP was trying to get me to force PBS and Vice Television to fill out these forms, which were completely inappropriate. I told them I wouldn't do it uh, until they showed me a program statement saying otherwise. And uh, then I recorded conversations with the local BOP regional representative, uh, Luz Luhan, in which they threatened me with an, refusing an order charge if I refused to sign these uh, legally uh, ascertained documents. So the next day I was arrested by the federal marshals, held for four days, a uh, law firm, uh, Boons and Hain, hired by one of my other uh, publishers, Wick Allison for G Magazine, threatened the BOP, uh, said they would go to a court and challenge the uh, terms of my confinement. And I was immediately released after that. Had you been informed, Barrett, at all, that, that you were not uh, permitted to speak to the media? Well, they, they, were, they were telling me that, and I recorded the conversations in which she, which these BOP officials and the halfway house uh, staff tried to tell me that. And as I said in the recordings, there's no such uh, dictate in the program statements. And unless, you know, I'm shown a program statement saying I don't have a right, I'm going to exercise that right. And I'm certainly not going to help them force media outlets to seek prior restraint uh, authorization from a, a random BOP official before doing their job. That's contrary to a number of, uh, you know, principles, uh, not just journalists have, but, you know, that go straight to the heart of the First Amendment. And again, it's just, it's, it's not legal. It's not a power they have. And, uh, you know, but they knew they could get away with holding me for a few days in prison without any, you know, long-term consequences. And they're probably right. This, this has, this is, this, this is a prison issue in one way, but it's a larger issue of the rule of law. Uh, and whether or not it actually exists, which I tend to claim that it doesn't. Barrett Brown, you've said that you're considering taking asylum overseas after being re-imprisoned? Yes. You know, the uh, I've been covered quite a bit in the press, especially when I was involved in Anonymous back in 2011, uh, sometimes over really silly things, inconsequential things, but, you know, things that were kind of lurid and exciting and perhaps seemingly romantic. Uh, in this case, even after I made very clear and, and did my best to document that a extraordinary crime against the First Amendment and against journalists, not just me, but other journalists, have been committed, there was really no press coverage other than from outlets like The Intercept and View Magazine that I write for, uh, a few independent outlets as well. Uh, it, it just the BOP and the DOJ and the FBI can operate beyond the law to a, to a pretty high extent, especially when dealing with activists. And I'm going to continue to do my activism work. I'm going to continue to try to organize uh, citizens against state criminality. But I can't do that from here, uh, you know, without being, you know, arrested, you know, by any official who chooses to do so. Uh, you know, and another, I have no problem doing prison time or, or being oppressed, you know, in the public eye if it helps. But it just doesn't help that often. It just doesn't lead to anything. This is not a kind of, the kind of society in which. People say, oh, no, that's, you know, that's something terrible has happened. Let's act on it. They just don't. In Germany, you know, a few years ago, what really impressed me is when a uh, state prosecutor was found to have been investigating a uh, news website that had been uh, publishing leaked documents. And after that came to light, uh, there were several days of marches. And, and three days after that, the, the prosecutor was out. And that would never happen in the U.S. And that's the kind of country I want to live in with people who I share some you know, degree of, of, of decency with. Can you just freely leave? After I'm, my probation is finished, which will be at the maximum uh, two years from now, uh, but more likely one year, I guess I'll be able to leave the country, uh, at which point I'll be giving up my citizenship and uh, applying for citizenship elsewhere. Well, Barrett Brown, by analyzing the information from the H.B. Gary hack, you discovered the security firm's plan to undermine our guest journalist Glenn Greenwald's defense of WikiLeaks. One slide read, quote, without the support of people like Glenn, WikiLeaks would fold. H.B. Gary intended to spread disinformation to discredit both Glenn Greenwald and WikiLeaks. In the documentary We Are Legion, the director spoke to former H.B. Gary CEO Aaron Barr about these plans. It seems like you're trying to attack a journalist here. Yeah, and I, you know, I don't want to talk too much more about Glenn Greenwald, but other than, you know, what I previously said is, you know, there was never an intent to attack uh, uh, journalists. Um, 
not on my part. You know, I, you know, nor I guess I should say gen, I should generalize that and to say that you know I, I would never just outwardly attack a journalist. Other than if I felt that there was a journalist in my mind that was acting uh, unethically, that you know that is um, a, a, that's a um, fair game for having a public discussion about. So uh, that was H.B. Gary CEO uh, Aaron Barr speaking in the documentary We Are Legion. Barrett Brown, can you explain what H.B. Gary is um, and the significance of what happened? Yeah, it, it was what they were doing was significant because we saw a number of contractors uh, aligned with the DOJ going after private citizens uh, in, this, in this very nefarious combination of, of state and corporate actors. You know, the, the Bank, of, Bank of America, which was concerned with WikiLeaks, and the Chamber of Commerce, which was concerned with several left-wing activist groups, can go to the DOJ and did and ask them, you know, hey, can you help us go after our enemies? They're, they're also citizens, but we don't like them, and you probably don't like them either. And that DOJ will say, okay, let's put you in touch with the Hunt and Williams law firm, and they'll arrange Palantir and H.P. Uh, Gary and Endgame Systems, and they'll uh, set up a uh, covert uh, disinformation campaign, and they'll, they'll hack uh, servers, and they'll try to set up activists on charges of fraud, and uh, it'll be great. That's an extraordinary uh, symptom of, of what's wrong with this country. Uh, I should note what's really important about all of this is that the, the Team Themis thing was actually stumbled upon by several different people at once. This was a great example, uh, one of several great examples of crowdsourced journalism. Uh, later on, we, we went on to document uh, you know, further abuses, both by H.B. Gary and by Palantir, uh, showed that Palantir was lying when they claimed that they, you know, this was a low-level Person only that was involved in this, and they didn't, you know, they didn't approve of it. But in fact, their chief counsel and a number of other employees were in on those emails. Uh, there were other projects as well that are, that are also, I think, very uh, indicative, not just in what it says about how the state operates with these interests, but also what they can do now. Uh, persona management was one particularly uh, frightening technology that involves uh, fake online personas that the military, uh, CENTCOM in this case can operate. Uh, these are provided by private companies, which again, turn around and sell them to whoever else, including foreign despots, uh, immoral you know, corporate actors across the world. We've seen this over and over again uh, with additional hacks that have shown you know, how Tunisia, for instance, was being assisted by the French government in oppressing its citizens. We see a company called Corvus in DC that assists Bahrain in uh, smearing dissidents. So crowdsourced journalism did, in this case, what mainstream journalists uh, couldn't do, which was stay on the stay on this subject, go through all of these emails, even after the headlines were over, after the first the month of amusing for media uh, aftermath from the actual hack uh, was over. Uh, we, you know, kept on it. We, we created an array of sort of relationships that other journalists could come and look at and use as a starting point if they wanted to go after this uh, larger story. So, Glenn Greenwald, if you could um, comment on this, because you were a subject of this, explain more what, who H.B. Gary is and their attempts to discredit you and what it meant for you. Well, let me just say that the Barrett Brown case is probably one of the most significant threats to press freedom that has happened in the United States in the last, I would say, two decades at least. And it's received remarkably little attention in the mainstream press, because they only pay attention when they themselves are attacked. So Donald Trump attacks some—posts uh, some childish insult about the media or calls in the enemy of the people, and it's wall-to-wall -wall coverage in The New York Times and, and CNN. And yet here was Barrett doing some of the most intrepid and important journalism in the United States, digging into this incredibly opaque and powerful faction. And because of his journalism into those areas, that is what directly triggered this FBI investigation and the attempt to imprison him. And the reason he got so little support from media organizations defending his press freedom was because they only care about press freedom when it comes to large corporate media outlets that aren't actually threatening to the government. And this was a case where Barrett discovered extreme levels of wrongdoing and corruption, including this slide that said it wanted to destroy my reputation to prevent me from continuing to defend WikiLeaks, talking about defending, uh, destroying the reputation of people who are activists on behalf against the chamber of commerce. Uh, 
he was doing incredibly important work. He's obviously a very talented journalist. The scribblings he did for us in prison on, on paper with pencil won the National Magazine Award for the columns that we published. Um, and yet now he's saying, just like Laura Poitras felt when she had to edit her film Citizen Four, that he can't safely do journalism in the United States. So we love to talk about Russia and press freedoms there, even though we have no impact on it when we do. We spend very little time talking about the real threats of fr to press freedom in this country because they happen to people like Barrett Brown rather than to MSNBC and The New York Times. But explain why it mattered what Gates B. Gary was saying, this information coming out, for example, on you. Well, these contractors that very few people have heard about, including H.P. Gary, I had never heard of them until until this happened, or Palantir, the, the organization funded by the billionaire Peter Thiel, exert extreme levels of power inside of this murky world of intelligence and defense contractors. And what they were planning to do was they were putting a pitch together to Bank of America using the firm Hutton and Williams, which is this powerhouse in D.C., to try and tell uh, the Bank of America, which at the time thought it was going to be the target of a WikiLeaks disclosure, let us use our dark arts and dirty little tactics to destroy the people who will be your critics. And that was the plan they were putting together that Anonymous discovered and Barrett reported on. And the only reason why it was discovered is because Anonymous randomly hacked into it. And what was amazing about it was there were dozens of people talking about these plans that were illegal or certainly unethical, and not one person ever said, wait a minute, isn't this going a little bit too far to destroy journalists for reporting on these events? That's how common this mentality is in that world and how much impunity there is for it. And that was what Barrett was on the verge of really uncovering at the time the FBI began trying to put him in prison. Well, in an interview uh, in uh, on Tuesday with the ACLU, uh, you talked about, uh, elaborated on the point you made now, about how the media itself persecutes its own sources, and that journalists take the lead in advocating for policies that would restrict their own press freedom. So, could you explain why you think that is? Because, of course, it's completely counterintuitive. Right. You would think, in just a normal, healthy democracy, you would have the government over here being adversarial to press freedoms, and then you would have journalists vehemently defending the power of the freedom of the, the press. That's how it's supposed to work. And yet, in so many cases, especially when the government targets journalists who aren't popular among or working within these mainstream outlets, not only do the journalists ignore it or acquiesce to these efforts to punish and criminalize and attack independent journalists, they become the leading cheerleaders. Um, when I first started doing the Snowden reporting, it wasn't, you know, James Clapp Rapper, um, or Keith Alexander going on TV calling for my imprisonment. It was David Gregory um, or Andrew Ross Sorkin or other journalists who work at the New York Times, someone uh, with a, an institution with a history of defending press freedom. And so that is a huge problem, is because so many mainstream journalists in the United States identify not with journalism, but with serving the interest of the U.S. government and the national security state, they become the leading spokespeople, the leading advocates for the right to criminalize journalism. The U.S. government doesn't have to defend trying to put uh, Julian Assange in prison for publishing documents. Journalists are happy to take the lead in arguing that that should happen, even though that will directly threaten them. Has that changed at all under Trump? Now that Trump has called the media the enemy of the people, the enemy of the American people, the media has found its backbone in some cases. Definitely. Do you think that will extend to what you're describing? No, unfortunately, I don't. And, and if you notice, there are certain uh, lines that the quote unquote resistance, including the media, won't cross. So, for example, when Trump bombed Syria with no congressional authorization and no plan, the media largely cheered. When he dropped the so called mother of all bombs in Afghanistan, the largest bomb short of a nuclear weapon in Afghanistan, the media cheered. And now that the CIA and Jeff Sessions are threatening to prosecute WikiLeaks and Julian Assange under the Espionage Act for publishing documents, you have major media figures, simply because they hate WikiLeaks and are incredibly short-sighted, supporting Jeff Sessions, supporting Mike Pompeo in the idea that WikiLeaks' publication of documents should be criminalized, even though that can then be turned around and used against them. So, no, they, they place off limits certain policies that are really dangerous, even if Trump is the one advocating them. Mm. I'm wondering, Barrett Brown, if you would do anything differently, um, uh, given that you ended up in jail for four years.
No. And I'm wondering your thoughts on Donald Trump firing James Comey, the FBI director. To say the least, you had a lot of dealings with the FBI. There was a great deal of disingenuousness in, in the argument over the last year over the Clinton investigation uh, on both sides. You know, I, w I watched uh, Comey testify before uh, Congress regarding the Clinton decision uh, from a federal prison with other federal inmates. All of us had been pursued at some point, sometimes multiple times, by the FBI and other federal agencies. And when he said that we treat everyone the same, there was you know audible laughter in the audience there. Uh, the FBI. First, first of all, no one can really say one way or the other what the FBI does. There is no broad uh, set of set of procedures. Uh, individual FBI agents and individual prosecutors across the country largely act uh, as they as they feel is appropriate in a particular situation. Uh, FBI agents lie on the stand pretty routinely. Uh, in my case, you can you can see them uh, trying to present something that Bob Beckel on Fox News said about killing Assange, and something that I had said, which is obviously bizarre for several reasons. You can just see over and over again that there's no negative feedback to the system. There's no reason why a prosecutor, prosecutor shouldn't uh, lie or withhold evidence, as they did in my case. Uh, there's no reason why FBI shouldn't uh, choose, pick and choose who they prosecute or who they you know, go after, uh, you know, just based on ideological, personal, or the haphazard factors. Uh, that's quite extensive. Obviously, my, you know, my mother was indicted for obstruction of justice, for hiding my laptops in her kitchen cabinet when it was not get a warrant for her house. So Clinton, Hillary Clinton, had she been someone else, you know, probably would have been indicted. Having said that, uh, George Bush, George W. Bush and many of his administration, had they been other people, had there not been a political element there or, or sort of a, an establishment sort of back scratching ethos whereby we really don't go after powerful people, uh, you know, they would have been indicted as well uh, had they been just regular people. So. Uh, the fact is, none of these people know, none of these people in the Senate and Congress really know what's normal for the FBI. There, there is no normal, uh, other than a degree of disingenuousness that kind of changes from, from case to case. Uh, DOJ, same thing. Uh, none of these people who were so upset about the DOJ, about Loretta Lynch, meaning with Clinton, uh, which, of course, is an extraordinarily egregious act, uh, you know, none of them were really upset about when the DOJ, again, was, was conspiring to go after journalists and activists in a way that they just not only it goes against their charter, but goes against the entire reason for being. Uh, there's a great deal, there's a great dance of disingenuousness that goes on uh, in our national dialogue, and uh, part of it's wrapped up in the establishment's regard for other establishment figures, whether they be in journalism or law enforcement or, or politics. Uh, and part of it just has to do with the deterioration of, of how we think as a society, uh, what kind of people make it to the top, what kind of people lead our national conversation. And it's uh, it's a huge, all-encompassing, fundamental problem, and it's uh, all the more dangerous because this is such a powerful uh, nation with such an extensive machinery that goes all across the world. Barrett Brown, are you able to step foot outside? You're under house arrest. I'm able to. I can go in my uh, front yard, I imagine. Uh, I'm supposed to be here unless I'm going to work or some other uh, wholesome appointments. Uh, I really don't mind now. I'm kind of a homebody anyway. I'll be off uh, home confinement in a few weeks. I'll then I'll be under the DOJ's probation department. Another good example of, of how haphazard this all is: the, the local probation department here in the Northern District of Texas is actually uh, very kind. Very, you know, they're run by sort of social worker types who wanted to get into this kind of uh, business to help people. So it, it just goes to show how how uh, these institutions are. They're not monolithic. Uh, there's nothing you really can really say about them that they'll do this. They want to do this. It's all just comes down to you know. It, when the rule of law doesn't really apply, when procedures can be violated at whim, uh, both for good or ill, uh, it's you're dealing with a big amorphous mass uh, rather than some, you know, really pristine uh, rule of law procedures that you can point to and say this this is a this is a uh, this is a wholesome system of governance. This is something we can you know we can definitely practice free speech on, but we can definitely expect that our rights will be uh, maintained. It's, you, it's uh, more complicated than that. Are you allowed to use a computer? I am. That's 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 debatable. Uh, the BOP uh, representative, just like uh, just like with their uh, interview stipulation that they've now backed off of, originally claimed that under my uh, terms of uh, home confinement that I'm not allowed to use a computer, and they're basing that off of my uh, terms of supervised release, which doesn't even start yet. That's my probation. 
That's investigative journalist Barrett Brown speaking while under house arrest in Dallas, Texas. He recently served a four-year prison sentence. And then, when he was released a few weeks ago, he was rearrested and then inexplicably released. Also, we were speaking to Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Glenn Greenwald. When we come back, Black Mama's bailout day, an effort to raise money to free as many African-American women from jail as possible before Mother's Day. Stay with us.